Today, we consider a report recommending that the House of Representatives hold Attorney General William Barr in contempt of Congress for defying a valid subpoena issued by this committee. Bill Barr is following the law, and what's his reward? Democrats are going to hold him in contempt. I don't think today is actually about getting information. I don't think it's about getting the unredacted Mueller report. I don't think last week's hearing was actually about having staff question the Attorney General. I think it's, as my colleague said earlier, I think it's all about trying to destroy Bill Barr because Democrats are nervous he's going to get to the bottom of everything. He's going to find out how and why this investigation started in the first place. Never forget what Bill Barr said a few weeks ago, three and a half weeks ago, when he testified in front of the Senate Finance Committee. He said a lot of important things, but he said three, excuse me, four very interesting things. First, he said there was a failure of leadership at the upper echelon, term he used, upper echelon of the FBI. We all know that's the case. Director Comey's been fired. Deputy Director McCabe fired, lied three times under oath, according to the Inspector General. FBI Counsel Jim Baker demoted and left, currently under investigation by the Justice Department. Lisa Page demoted and left. Peter Strzok, Deputy Head of Counterintelligence, demoted and fired. Peter Strzok, the guy who ran the Clinton investigation and the Russian investigation. There was certainly a failure of leadership at the upper echelon of the FBI. Second thing the Attorney General said three and a half weeks ago in front of the Senate Finance Committee, spying did occur. Said it twice. Yes, spying did occur. Third, he said, there's a basis for my concern about the spying that took place. And maybe the most interesting thing, two terms he used that frankly I find frightening. He said there was, in his judgment, he thinks there may have been unauthorized surveillance and political surveillance. Scary terms. We got to go back to January 3rd, 2017. Senator Schumer on the Rachel Maddow show talking about then President elect Trump says this. If you take on the intelligence community, they have six ways from Sunday at getting back at you. Now, I don't know if the FBI went after President Trump in six ways, but I sure know they went after him in two ways. And the first one is the now famous dossier on October 21st, 2016. The FBI used one party's opposition research document as the basis to go to a secret court to get a warrant to spy on the other party's campaign. That happened. Democrat National Committee, the Clinton campaign, paid Perkins Cooey Law Firm, who hired Fusion GPS, who then hired a foreigner, Christopher Steele, who did what? Talked to Russians and put together this salacious, unverified document that became the basis to get a warrant to spy on the Trump campaign. They did it, and when they went to the court, they didn't tell them important things like who paid for it. They didn't tell them that Christopher Steele had already told the FBI and the Justice Department that he was, quote, desperate to stop Trump. And they didn't tell the court that Christopher Steele had been fired by the FBI because he's out talking to the press. They did that. And second, just last Thursday, just last Thursday, New York Times story, FBI sent investigator posing as an assistant to meet with the Trump aide in 2016. FBI sent someone in pretending to be somebody else to talk with George Papadopoulos, who was with the Trump campaign. You know what they call that? It's called spying. They did it. They did it twice, and who knows how much more. And what I know is Bill Barr has said he's going to get to the bottom of it. And think about the term he used again. This is important. Political surveillance. The In the United States of America, I will not yield. Think about that term. He's going to get to the He said he's going to put a team together, going to investigate all this. This is critical. And never forget the guy who ran this investigation, Peter Strzok ran the Clinton investigation, and then launched and ran the Trump-Russia investigation. Never forget what he said. Trump should lose 100 million to zero. We need an insurance policy. Told Lisa Page, don't worry, Lisa, we'll stop Trump. This is what Bill Barr wants to investigate. And as, other, as my colleagues have said, this is the House Judiciary Committee with the history this committee has in protecting fundamental liberties and protecting the Constitution. Last week, there was another important document. Document Emmett Flood, sent to the Attorney General. I just want to read a couple sentences. Under our system of government, unelected executive branch officers and intelligence agency personnel are supposed to answer to the person elected by the people, the president, and not the other way around. This is not a Democrat or Republican issue. It's a matter of having a government responsible to the people, to we the people. In, a partisan, in the partisan commotion surrounding the Mueller report, it would be well to remember that what can be done to a president can be done to any of us. And this committee is supposed to look out for that fundamental fact more than anything else. And we are not doing that today. My good friend from Georgia just asked the operative question, how can we impeach if we don't get the documents? How can we impeach if we don't get the documents? Ladies and gentlemen, this hearing is not about the attorney general. 
It's not about the Mueller report, 92% of which everyone in America has had the opportunity to read. It's not about the fact that even the portions that the American people haven't been able to read, the chairman's been able to go read had he chosen. This is all about impeaching the president. Now, why don't they just say it? Why don't they just jump to the impeachment proceedings like their liberal media overlords are telling them to do? Well, the reason is that the American people don't support impeachment. And it's easy to understand why. They actually went and elected Donald Trump, president of the United States. And I don't think people are gonna support impeaching a president who's doing so well. I mean, you got 3.2% growth in the economy. The Trump economy is hot. And the reason we're doing so well is as a consequence of the president's policies. And so at a time when my Democrat colleagues are focused on the next election and not solutions to the problems facing Americans, they can't attack the president's policies because people are doing well. So typically they roll next to identity politics that based on what you look like, who you pray to or who you love, you can't possibly support Republicans. But African-Americans are doing better. Hispanics are doing better. Women are doing better. We are seeing a rising tide that is truly lifting all boats in this country. And so now we have this effort not to argue with policies, not to typically go to the identity politics that functions as the organizing principle of today's Democratic Party. They have to delegitimize the guy that the won, delegitimize the guy that people voted for, but they don't have the guts to do it directly, and so they're going after the Attorney General. Now, the gentleman from Georgia in his last remark said, we are hiding behind the rules. Hiding behind the rules. These are federal laws that dictate what the Attorney General can and cannot do. We're not hiding behind the rules. We just like to follow them. By the way, it's not following the rules that got us in this trouble in the first place. When the inspector general testified before us, he said it's the fundamental fact that during the investigations of Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump, you saw continuous examples of a one-off here, a violation of protocol there. The inspector general said never before had he seen a circumstance where the very same team that was investigating Hillary Clinton would then go and investigate the other person that was involved in the 2016 presidential contest. About a month ago, in this committee, I laid out the stages of grief, denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance. And I think that folks watching at home can probably follow along and see where we're headed. First, my Democratic colleagues were in denial. When they saw that there was no collusion after saying for 22 months that the president was an agent of the Russian government, after saying for 22 months that there was actual evidence of collusion, they were in denial when they saw the conclusion that there wasn't. Then there was anger. It had to be the attorney general's fault. Mueller didn't make a decision on obstruction. Somebody had to, the attorney general did. So they got mad at him. And we had this whole kerfluffle of anger. Well, now we know the third step, bargaining. Well, Mr. Attorney General, you've given us 92% of the Mueller report, but we have to bargain for the remaining 8% because that's really where we think the action is. Well, Mr. Attorney General, you spent five hours before the Senate Judiciary Committee Three of our presidential candidates got to question you. You offered to come before the House Judiciary Committee. You offered to come for an additional hour of questioning, but we have to bargain so that our staff lawyers can ask you questions. Now, I don't think it's a good sign that the next sign after bargaining is depression. So I, I feel for my Democrat colleagues, but after that we get to acceptance, and that's sure something that I'm looking forward to because there are some really good ideas that my Democratic colleagues have once they kind of get to acceptance on the no Russia collusion thing. My, my friend, the gentleman from Rhode Island, has excellent ideas about how to change the way that consumers interface with big tech companies. My, my colleague from the state of New York is right that if the First Step Act is the only step act, then there's, then that would be a bad thing. We need to do more on criminal justice reform. My, my colleague uh, who's not with us from California, Mr. Swalwell, he's got great ideas to unlock potential cures with medical cannabis reform, but we're not doing any of those things. And by the way, I bet a bunch of my friends on the other side of the aisle low-key wish that their actual bills that would impact the lives of Americans would get heard instead of this garbage. The Obama administration ran an intel operation against the Trump campaign. Peter Strzok opened it up, the dossier kept it going, and now the Democrats need to get over it. For a once great judiciary committee, I know my first term, 05 and 06, I saw our current chairman as a champion for privacy rights, for civil rights, for Fourth Amendment rights, Fifth Amendment rights, and something dramatically has changed over the years. There was concern back then about too much power 
through the FISA courts, through the Patriot Act, and we shared a number of those concerns. And now this committee majority is on the wrong side of a very important historic time. We've never had the intelligence community, the FBI, people at the top of the DOJ, abusing their powers to create a case against a president where there was none, where assets were actually used to try to set up members of the Trump campaign when there was no case to try to create a case. We ought to be all over that. We ought to be demanding answers from the FISA judge or judges who were either A, content to have fraud committed against their courts, or were complicit. Maybe it was Peter Strzok's buddy that he bragged about in his text that was going to be the FISA judge that uh, signed warrants where there was no probable cause of anything. This was an attempted coup, and history is bringing that into focus more and more clearly. And what does this committee do about the abuses, the attempted coup? It comes in and decides we're going to go after the attorney general who's trying to clean up the mess. Christopher Race sure hasn't. Instead of asking from the intel community, let us see the 100% certain proof you have that Hillary Clinton's personal server was hacked by China. No, he covers it up. Says we still hadn't seen it. Well, they hadn't asked to see it. There is a disaster that has occurred in our justice system, and this committee has oversight responsibilities, and we are abusing those. This motion for contempt is not being done in good faith. I'm not going to call anybody on this committee the names that my colleague from Tennessee just did in violation of our rules of decorum. But the truth is, we know that this committee majority is not acting in good faith. How? Because they're moving con for contempt for an attorney general failing to turn over material that this majority, at least some, maybe it's just the staff, but some people know that you can't hold someone in contempt. You can vote to do that, but you can't be in contempt for failing to produce things that are illegal for you to produce. How do we know somebody over there knows that this is wrong? Is because there was an offer. Look, Attorney General Barr, if, if you'll join us in going to court and getting a court order so that we can get the grand jury proceedings and evidence, then we will disregard the contempt. Well, that's evidence of a state of mind by the majority that at least somebody over there knows you cannot be con in contempt for failing to produce what would be illegal to produce without a court order. You're on the wrong side of history. And there is no joy here in seeing the abuses. I hope and pray literally for the day when we can join forces and quit trying to push this idea of an attempted coup and uncover the abuses that have truly gone on. My time's This is not a step we take lightly. It is the culmination of nearly three months of requests, discussions, and negotiations with the Department of Justice with a complete unredacted report by Special Counsel Mueller into Russian interference in the 2016 election, along with the underlying evidence. I appreciate the fact that the department responded to the offer we made to them last week and met with us yesterday in a last minute effort to reach an accommodation. We heard the department out, we responded to them in good faith, and after all was said and done, we unfortunately were still unable to reach agreement and we proceeded with our markup today. As I've said before, we remain ready and willing to consider any reasonable offer made by the department even after today's vote. But if a letter I received late last night from the department is any indication, I am concerned that the department is heading in the wrong direction. In response to our latest good faith offer, the department abruptly announced that if we move forward today, it would ask President Trump to invoke what it refers to as a protective assertion of executive privilege 
on all of the materials subject to our subpoena. Just minutes ago, it took that dramatic step. Besides misapplying the doctrine of executive privilege, since the White House waived these privileges long ago, and the department seemed open to sharing these materials with us just yesterday, this decision represents a clear escalation in the Trump administration's blanket defiance of Congress constitutionally mandated duties. I hope that the department will think better of this last-minute outburst and return to negotiations. As a co-equal branch of government, we must have access to the materials that we need to fulfill our constitutional responsibilities in a manner consistent with past precedent. This is information we are legally entitled to receive and we are constitutionally obligated to review. Today, we are meeting to consider a resolution to hold Attorney General Bill Barr in contempt of Congress. So let's take just a few moments and go through this. What is the justification for holding Attorney General Barr in contempt of Congress? Perhaps that he failed to abide by the special counsel regulations? No, he went above and beyond what the regulations required by transmitting the full report to Congress with limited redactions. Could it be that the Attorney General failed to accommodate the chairman's demands for information? No, he offered to let the chairman and five other Democrat leaders review the less redacted report at, D at the D Department of Justice, including a 99.9% .9 unredacted volume on obstruction. In an odd move for anyone demanding access to information, the chairman and the other elected Democrats given access have declined to view that report. The Attorney General also volunteered to testify before this committee about the report's conclusions and his role in sharing the report. And as we all witnessed, the Democratic gamesmanship forced the Attorney General to forego the scheduled hearing last week. On Monday, the Justice Department offered to meet to discuss accommodations. Yesterday, they made a reasonable offer to avert this spectacle, and once again, they were rebuffed and the chairman declined. Perhaps then the Democrats believe that there has been an unreasonable delay in the Justice Department's response to their subpoena. No, that's not true either. In fact, the chairman is moving to this contempt resolution at lightning speed. It has been less than 20 days since the chairman, Nadler, subpoenaed documents from the Justice Department. When the Oversight Committee held Eric, Attorney General Eric Holder in contempt, more than 250 days had passed between the subpoena and the committee's vote to hold him in contempt. More than 450 days passed between the committee's initial request to the Justice Department and the committee's contempt vote. Judiciary Democrats are moving more than 10 times faster than Oversight did with Holder. They have moved to, from request to contempt vote in only 43 days. And yet the Justice Department is still at the negotiating table waiting for the Democrats to arrive in good faith. Why this rush? Without any valid legislative or administrative reason, we can only assume the Democrats that are led by the chairman have resolved to sully the Bill Barr's good name and reputation to accomplish two goals. First, Democrats are angry the special counsel's report did not produce the material or collusions they expected to pave their path to impeaching the president. I feel compelled to remind everyone the report found, despite offers to do so, no one from the Trump campaign knowingly conspired with the Russian government. And you can't help but notice the phrase Russian collusion has vanished from the Democratic talking points and left a void in the narrative. Since the special counsel did not make a prosecutorial determination on obstruction, which was his job, the attorney general and the deputy attorney general did so according to their mandates as law enforcement officials while giving no credence to the Office of Legal Counsel's opinion regarding that of sitting presidents. As a result, they're angry. They're angry our nation's chief law enforcement officer and his deputy had the audacity to decide the evidence didn't support charges for obstruction and investigation into something the president didn't do. Second, Democrats are afraid of what the Attorney General will find when he completes his ongoing review of FISA abuses at the Justice Department, including how the Russia investigation began. Multiple news reports have suggested those conclusions could be explosive, could end careers, and could even lead to criminal prosecution. Rather than face that, the Democrats have resolved to neutralize Bill Barr by attacking him and the office and his integrity and his career. This is the first step. What a cynical, mean-spirited, counterproductive, irresponsible step it is. Re reputational interests? Really? Many of my colleagues on the other side of the aisle actually perpetrated a witch hunt as it relates to securing more than 800,000 documents from this very same Department of Justice without regard to the reputational interests of Americans who have served this country. You weren't concerned with the reputational interests of Hillary Clinton. In fact, the top Republicans said that the sole objective was to undermine her the former first lady and secretary of state. You weren't concerned with the reputational interests of Peter Strzok and Lisa Page. In fact, you embarrassed those two. They made mistakes, but you embarrassed those two. You weren't concerned with the reputational interests of Andy McCabe. So don't peddle that phony argument. 
to us. This very same Department of Justice turned over 800,000 pages of documents, but they won't turn over a single page pursuant to a legitimately issued subpoena. And then you want to assert executive privilege. Are you kidding me? You can't assert executive privilege after the fact when the closest advisors to the president have already spoken to Team Mueller. Wait a second. Let's try to go through this. White House counsel Don McCann talked to Mueller. There is no assertion of executive privilege. White House press secretary Sarah Huckabee Sanders talked to Mueller. No assertion of executive privilege. White House communications director Hope Hicks talked to Mueller. There was no assertion of executive privilege. It's a phony argument. The House is a separate and co-equal branch of government. We're not a wholly owned subsidiary of the Trump administration. We don't work for Donald Trump. We work for the American people. We have a constitutional responsibility to serve as a check and balance on an out of control executive branch. The attorney general is totally out of control. He will be held 